Okay, we're getting close to break time. A couple more presentations and then we'll be able to take a break. Let's start with this gentleman. He's 24 years old. He's an outfielder. He throws right and bats left. Why is that important? His right shoulder is his lead shoulder hitting under some stress. So we're going to consider treatment based on how to get him back to play. Seasonal timing is important. This is June, so it's the middle of the season. This player was taking a lead on first base, and he went to cover the base on a pickoff attempt, and you can see it on his slide back to first base. He's got an injury to his right shoulder. You can see how weak it is. Players say, I got this dead arm. You can picture this player saying, yeah, my arm went dead. Okay, so there's some load there. This is his MRI scan. You can see that there's a Hill Sachs lesion here, edema pattern, injury to the labrum over here. So this is a instability event. Let's go over what we're trying to deal with when people injure their anterior shoulder. There's so much balance between maintaining motion so that they can throw hard, but also maintaining stability. What a dilemma. This is our dilemma taking care of these athletes, maintaining stability and the setting of this enormous range of motion. Two injuries happen when you injure your shoulder. It could be a lot of capsule or a lot of labrum or some combination of capsular stretch and labral detachment. Labrum being that lining tissue of the socket here, capsule getting stretched. So when we evaluate and we're going to decide treatment, there's important features. How old is the patient? What's their position? How many instability events? Are they having instability in the past? How easily did it relocate? Did they need help? Did they go to an emergency room or just go back in on their own? And of course, the one that's biggest, is it their throwing shoulder? Throwing shoulder is under so much stress that that's going to make it harder for them to recover and what their symptoms are like. We went over all of the physical exam today, which is uh, really fabulous. Here's a little bit of just redundancy on the physical exam. This is that load and shift test. This is a left-handed throwing outfielder. You can see there is some translation both in the front and to the back. We're shifting the ball relative to the socket in different planes. He's asymptomatic. This is just him saying, okay, you can take my video. This is some dynamic label shear testing for posterior label tear, but also if you pull up on the shoulder and then push down, if they have symptoms of instability, it's relieved when you push posterior on the humerus. This is what the MRI scan looks like. Here's the schematic. You tear this labrum. It's really the attachment of that capsule that we saw in the cadaver dissection, and that's what gets injured. So the surgical indications, the purest indication for surgery is they tried to get better without surgery. It didn't work. That's the purest. But seasonal timing and career timing pay such a big factor in this. It doesn't matter if you're in high school, college, professional, free agent. It depends where you're going with your career timing. And we'll get into that more in the panel discussion. The degree of pathology, more pathology, more likely that they're going to fail non-operative treatment. We already talked about the throwing shoulder is under more demands. Here's some work that we did. It's trying to uncover what happens if you elect non-operative treatment. So we had some patients, multiple sports, so not very specific to, say, uh, baseball, but patients will choose. They make the decision on whether to have early surgery with the guidance of their physicians, and a large percentage will say, I, I'm going to get surgery could be the end of the season. They know their season's over. They got to get ready for next year. Some will wait and see what their symptoms are like. And if we go across this wait and see look, about half of them will go on to have surgery. So even if you try non-operative treatment, if you're a competitive athlete, especially collision athlete, and or if it's your throwing shoulder as a baseball player, you're going to wind up having issues about half the time and you're going to uh, elect to have surgery. So non-operative treatment, here's 30% of people in this one study completed a season without recurrent instability, but there were in-season instability events. When someone says, I'm not having surgery, what typically happens is mom is nodding her head when you're talking about surgery and the kid is going like this. There's no way. He's already tuned out. He's like, get me out. I'm playing next week. What does that mean? If you let the kid play and they dislocate again, 
they're likely going to have worsening pathology. That's the challenge with allowing someone to declare themselves. And there's a funny statement, you know, you never operate on somebody after the first dislocation, but always operate on them before the second dislocation. <laughs> okay, this is what the exam looks like if they wind up having surgery. You saw normal exam. This is what they'd let you do when they're under anesthesia. So that's what we're trying to do when they're not under anesthesia. When they're under anesthesia, they let you do that. This is a patient on the lateral position. So they're lying on their side. We're looking from the back. So you can see the humeral head on the top and the spinal needle, that needle there is showing the labrum. This is a dent in the back of the ball where it hits the glenoid on the way out. So you get what's called a hill saction, that dent. And all of this is torn labral tissue here. Okay, look, I got a pointer now. But I'm having a hard time advancing with the pointer. Okay, never use the pointer. Okay, we put the camera in the, um, in the front and now we're, we're setting up to fix this and you can see the amount of labral tear. It's all the way from, that position is at the most inferior part. We would call that six o'clock, extending past six o'clock if we use it uh, as a clock face to describe the anatomy. And then we're gonna set up some stimulation so that this heals. We're gonna abrade things to make it want to heal better. Okay, control Z usually helps me when I'm uh, when I want to undo. So it looks like you're gonna have to point. Do you want to get me off the off the laser pointer? Okay, this is a. Uh, I just want to be able to advance the slides. Yeah, arrow. Just a cursor. Basically, when it's not working, you just keep clicking. Okay, so we pass it. What's cool about this is we pass sutures. You see this stitch here? It looks like a shoelace. This thing is so strong, you can't break this with your hands. You pass it through the labral tissue, and then you could push it into the bone. There's so much friction that you can put these implants in, and there's no need to tie knots. And you heard about slap lesions, where if you tie knots, knots are devastating to the articular cartilage. And I think we heard from Hollis and others, we have an opportunity to repair things, but we also have an opportunity to do damage when we're in somebody's shoulder. So I, uh, in, in some ways, I'm embarrassed of, of the things that we did 10 years ago where we tied all these big knots, even though we were uh, fixing things, we had these implants that were abrading the cartilage. So we can get a nice labral repair like this. So that's just showing you what happens inside the shoulder. For those of you who are in the rehab side of things or athletic training side of things, sometimes it's good to see what happened and how it gets fixed. Here's a typical rehab process, immobilization, protection. The younger they are, the more you want to protect them because they all break the rules. And then uh, strengthening range of motion. We'll talk more about rehab in our rehab session. And here's that typical external rotation that we're seeing more and more of. If they're going to throw, we have to, it's their throwing shoulder. We're going to avoid over tightening the capsule in an effort to preserve motion, especially external rotation. So here's our athlete. There was the MRI scan. Here's exam under anesthesia. Basically, we did what just what we did uh, on that example video. This happens to be that player. We put everything back together. There's the labral tissue all sewn up. Just to give you an example, what happens on a competitive athlete throwing shoulder. Four months, he starts his throwing program, delay hitting. Del hitting starts a couple months later. He has discomfort. He shuts down happens. I wish every recovery was smooth. It's not always smooth. There's some turbulence here and there, but he's back playing. He gets, uh, he plays in minor leagues for 11 months, but look, before he gets into a major league game, it's next season. It doesn't have to be that way. They can get better faster. It's just not everything goes so smoothly. Okay.
I think baseball is interested in changing the base. I don't know if it's the base, but there's another player who hurts his shoulder on a pickoff attempt. This is a different player. It's like almost exactly the same mechanism. You saw this from Hollis. There's an injury to the glenoid at the bone, and we got a CT scan to see the bone better. He's got a fracture of his glenoid just by diving back to the base. This is what it looks like at arthroscopy. That's the broken piece of bone with the cartilage. We can fix the labrum above and below it to make sure that it's anatomic so that it heals in the anatomic position. And he gets back actually easier than the player with the labral tear. Okay, one last one. Not everybody gets hurt sliding head first to first base. They get hurt at home plate. Okay, this is an outfielder. Pitcher did not want to give up that run. And uh, so he's got the same type of injury pattern with hill sacks, anterior labral tear. Just showing you another example of how we put it back together, another position player. So these injuries happen diving. They happen with collisions. This is our baseball book. This baseball book was, it's on Amazon. It's available this is the book that was made to support this meeting. In fact, any title that comes up on a presentation in this meeting is in this book. And Jeff Dugas wrote the chapter on instability. Here's some literature that suggests inferior outcomes in baseball compared to other sports. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's our challenge in baseball athletes. I'd rather operate on a football player who dislocates their uh, shoulder uh, compared to a baseball player on their throwing side. And if you're a pitcher and it's your throwing side that gets injured, you have a high risk of getting an inferior outcome. And for many of us who take care of high school athletes, the kids in the fall want to play football. They injure and dislocate their shoulder playing football on their dominant side. That completely changes their future in baseball. So I see a lot of kids who come in the fall, they dislocated their shoulder. And they regret it because baseball is their primary sport. Okay, thank you very much.